let us begin. <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. Again, Lord, I thank you for these students, most of them, and I thank you for the opportunity we have to study your creation together. pray that you would uh, help us to understand the math today. In your name I pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. Um, <laughs> um, <clears throat> okay, so so basically here's a story I want to tell you just to contrast. I want to contrast the Jordan versus rational canonical form. In the case that um, they can be contrasted. In other words, in the case that the Jordan form actually exists. Okay, so in both cases, we're studying some endomorphism, some linear transformation, which goes nowhere, linear transformation from V to V, okay, over some field F. And we're assuming that this contains all the eigenvalues. Okay, so then <clears throat> basically the story is this. The rational canonical form says you look at um, both of them really say we look at um, the characteristic polynomial, right, of t, um, and that's going to be something like what, x minus lambda one to the um, what do I want to say, m one power, x minus lambda two to the m two power, da da da, da x minus lambda, let's say s to the m s power, um, and then we also sometimes think about the minimal polynomial of t, which is going to have the same zeros, but possibly different multiplicities, right? Okay, so these, these are kind of always on our mind as we're studying these things. But um, in this case, the prime divisors of the minimal polynomial are all just linear factors. The prime divisors, the p sub i of x is are just x minus lambda i or what we'd have called x minus alpha i before in the book. And the thing is, um, the rational canonical form, it says you can, you can look at v, all right? You can look at v as being the direct sum of these cyclic subspaces generated by like v1, v2, da 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 da, um, vs, right? And, and what did we say? Each one of these vectors, what's the connection between um, these vectors v1 through vs and the, um, the minimal polynomial, what was the connection for the rational canonical form? The connection was that the order of vj was exactly uh, p of x, p, pj of x, which is the, um, I guess pj of x, technically pj of x to the, in my current notation, n, n upper j. Um, and that, what is the order of, well, this is basically, so you have pj of t to the nj. This is basically smallest operator um, which sends what? vj to 0, right? So if you look at the, the definition of the order, um, it's a polynomial which, when you plug in um, the transformation and then you let the transformation, the, the, the polynomial of the transformation act on the vector, it gives you back zero. And it's like the smallest one that does it. I mean, so. <clears throat> okay, and that it has to also be modic, right? And then what you do then is you make a basis, right? where you're building a basis for each one of these cyclic subspaces, what, what's a typical one look like? Well, like, let's just focus on the first one. Um, this looks something like, has basis what? Basis beta 1, um, which would be formed by what? What do you do? Like, um, well, for my convenience and simplicity, let's suppose, let, let us just suppose that, um, Well, that's too simple. Golly. Curses. Earlier I was thinking of this in terms of something slightly different. 
Um, well, fine, n minus 1. What does it look like? Then you do what? You do the, the strategy was you do p. Um, in this case, what is, what is, what is pj? And what's p1 here? In my current notation, it would just be x minus lambda 1, right? Why? I mean, I'm essentially defining it to be that. Um, P of t, P1 of t, right? <coughs> acting on v1 would be equal to t acting on v1 minus lambda 1 v1, which, by the way, is, is going to be what? That's going to be 0 if v1 is an eigenvector with eigenvalue lambda 1. So what I'm telling you is that for an eigenvector v1, the order of v1 is just the polynomial x minus lambda 1. Right. Um, OK, but um, how to say this? It doesn't have to be that v1 is an eigenvector, right? Though it could be that this is square. It could be that p1 of x is squared or cubed or something like that. And then we have to, we have to go to the trouble of doing what we do, like, um, how's it go? It's uh, p of t, p, see, p1 of t times what? Times v1. And then what comes next? t, is this right? Or was, did it start with the t? I can't remember. You guys have to help me out here. What's, what's the, I think it starts with, dang it. I didn't want to look at this. I've, I have, I have, mm, it's not wrong what I'm doing, but it's just not what I wanted to do. Curses. What's that? How's this go? Do you guys remember? Obviously, I don't. <coughs> Are you using the basis for the? For the, rash, for the, for the companion matrix to, what did we start with there? Should that be v2 and v squared v? Is that the other one? Um, yeah, so let's see here. All right, let, let me try to see if I, if I, the thing is if I make n equal to 1, it's too simple. There's just one thing in the basis, right? Um, so I should think about n equal to 2 at least, right? Um, man. I'm sorry, guys. I, I, I'm having a mental block here in how to communicate this all of a sudden. I was talking to Lorenzo earlier, and I had a nice discussion I'm trying to replicate here, and I, I failed. What's that? I think you're right. What about t? It's, it starts with t? No, on the next one. Oh. t, p1 of t, p1. Yeah. And, um, how, how far does that go on? Well, here p is just first degree, right? So <sighs> I'm sorry, guys. Let me just, man. Curses. What I was trying to show you guys is if I had something like Oh, I'm all stuck again. Curses. So the, the point here, I'm trying to. This is what you have in mind. Ah. Yeah, see, the thing when I was talking to you, Lorenzo, is I was, I, I didn't assume the minimal polynomial had a particular form, right? I just said something like, so this one would be something like, suppose this comes from, so I didn't actually assume this. This was the, the extra detail I've added, which has confused me um, because I'm trying to be too specific. But if this one had prime power like p1 of x, right? <coughs> Thanks. 
So let's just set, set aside my very specific comments about the characteristic of minimal polynomial for a second here. So if p1 of x is the, um, the prime power, and let's just suppose it has multiplicity 1, all right? So you just have this elementary divisor of p1x. And, um, and, and let's suppose that that has the form, what, like x to the what? x to the r minus alpha to the r minus 1, x to the r minus 1, minus da 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 minus alpha naught, right? Then the basis that we use for this first one is what? It's something like. Um, you know, it looks like what? It looks like V, um, TV, T squared V, da da da, T to the what? Um, T to the R minus 1 V, right? And so with, that, with respect to that basis, right, what happens if you look at, so if we, if we call these things, um, you know, like F1 through F, FR, F1, F2, 3, da, 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 FR. Well, you can easily see like T of, T, of, T, of v, T of V is what? Well, that's, in other words, this is T of F1 is what? T of F1 is F2, right? Because T of V is, that's the definition, right? T of, if, if V is equal to F1, then T of F1 is F2. And so what does that tell us? Well, that tells us that if you look at the matrix, of t with respect to um, beta 1, well, the first column looks like what? 0, 1, 0, and so forth, right? Right? Or in other words, this is column 1, you know? And this continues. Like, you look at t of f2, what do you get? You get f3, right? Because t of, v, t of tv is t squared v, right? And that's why this gives us the second column. So the, you know, the second column in the matrix is what? It's 0, um, 0, 1. Wait a minute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 0. <coughs> right, because each, <coughs> each basis element is just obtained by what? By just acting, act on the one before, it gets you to the next one, right? And that's what puts ones down the subdiagonal of the companion matrix, all the way until you get to what? You get to this guy, right? And then that's the weird case. That's the the, R, the last column, t of t r minus one, right? Which would be what t of what f? Which is that? That's the rth one, f r. Well, that's that's t r of v, right? Which is what? Which is Right, so we're assuming that what? We're assuming that P1 of T acting on V is zero, okay? So under that assumption, that means that TRV, right, is equal to these guys. So it's equal to like alpha naught plus alpha one T of uh, alpha one V excuse me, it's equal to alpha naught v plus alpha 1 t of v plus da 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 plus alpha to the r minus 1 t to the r minus 1 v. But you see what that is. That's alpha naught f1 plus alpha 1 f2 plus da 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 plus alpha r minus 1 f r minus 1. And that's why the last column in the companion matrix has what form? So the last column, so like the rth column, in the companion matrix, which is the matrix of T with respect to this, I'm calling it beta 1, I guess. 1, 1. <coughs> is what? It's just alpha naught, alpha 1, alpha r minus 1, right? You put these together, you've got what? You've got. So my, my point to you guys is just this. Um, so this is what? This is the companion matrix. He calls it A of what? 
a of what? P1x, right? What's the question? So the, the, the whole point, though, here is that the basis is built from taking a particular vector and just getting the next one by operating by t, right? That's the kind of basis which builds a companion matrix. The Jordan form is, is, is constructed in kind of a similar way. The Jordan form is also based on for finding a direct sum decomposition of the vector space. But the difference is, for the Jordan form, Yes. Sorry. I can't count. <clears throat> you know, if I was teaching number theory this semester, I might have not messed that up. I've, I've, forgotten, I've forgotten how to count again. These things will happen. But um, <clears throat> the Jordan form, on the other hand, let me just be mu much more specific, all right? So, like, so for the Jordan form, you might have something like, um, uh, how to say, you might have like a, for example, a three by three matrix, right? And you need with, with a three chain. Um, well, sorry, I, I'm still, I need to talk about the big picture just for a second, just for a second here. So the big picture, of course, is that V is still equal to like um, the direct sum of, of vectors. Let me call them, well, I'll call them Ws, just I don't want you to think they're the same ones as the Vs over there necessarily, but um, it's also the direct sum of these things. But the, the difference is, is that the way we're building these cyclic subspaces is, 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 is a little bit different. Um, and I, I do think the enumeration is the same. I think that, in fact, there's a direct correspondence between the primary decomposition here and there. It's just a different way of capturing each one of the, the components. Like, so, so for example, if this one, is um, from a, from a, let's say, a three chain with, say, lambda equals to two, right? What that means is that there exists, let's say, w1 not equal to zero, such that what? Such that um, t minus two i cubed acting on w1 is equal to zero, yet what? t minus two i and here I mean the identity transformation. Sorry, I should just say t minus 2 in my usual lingo, right? t minus 2 squared acting on w1 is what? It's not equal to 0. All right? What does this make? This makes, this makes w1 a generalized eigenvector of order 3. Because the third power of t minus, the third power of t minus 2 kills it, whereas the second one doesn't. If you have this, then you can construct a basis in a different way. So a different basis. Let me call it, say, gamma. I'll, I'll call it, just understand it's not the same beta, right? Um, so let's say beta equals 2. So the first thing I do is I put t minus 2 um, times what? t minus 2 uh, squared times w1. And then I do t minus 2 times w1 w1, and then I put w1. So I build the basis for that particular block in the decomposition using a chain of generalized eigenvectors. Now, how does this work? Well, again, let's just think about this for a minute. This is f1. This is f2. This is f3. What's, th what's that mean? What's the matrix of that look like? Well, what's t of f1? Well, excuse me. We have to be a little bit indirect here. What's t minus 2 on f1? What's that equal to? That's the same as t minus 2 cubed on w1, right? Which is what? That's 0, right? So what's this, what does this actually say? This tells us, in fact, that t of f1 is equal to what? 2f1. So that translates to the first column 
in this matrix for this particular chain. Of course, we understand it's going to be just one of the blocks in the block diagonal decomposition. Um, but here's the, you know, here's the first block we're looking at anyway, 2, 0, 0. Right. On the other hand, if we look at t minus 2 on f2, what do we get then? Let's see, f2 is what? f2 is this. This gives me t minus 2 squared acting on w1, which is also known as what? That's f1, right? So what equation does that give me? That gives me that t of f2 is equal to 2f2 again plus f1. So column 2 of t beta beta is, let's see here, we've got one copy of f1, two copies of the second thing in the basis, which puts a 2 here, and a 0 down here. So what I'm, what I'm trying to tell you guys is that the Jordan form and, and also the rational canonical form, they're both about taking this, the vector space and like breaking it up into pieces which are T invariant. All right? The thing is, for the Jordan form, we use eigenvectors and generalized eigenvectors to build a basis such that the matrix is a really, really nice form, right? This so-called Jordan block decomposition. You see what happens for F3? You get T minus 2 times what? W1, right? Which is just what? F2, right? So T of F3 is what? 2F3 plus F2. So column 3 of T beta beta is 0, 1, 2. You put these together, you got the Jordan block. 2, 2, 2, 1 it's on the super diagonal zeros everywhere else. Now what's, what's the downside of this, of course, is that you can only do this if the eigenvalues are real, right? If you're looking at a real vector space, right? Or if they're rational, if it's a rational vector space. In contrast, this, of course, allows for eigenvalues that are you don't have to have eigenvalues, and you can still you can always calculate the rational canonical form because you can always factor your minim minimal polynomial as far as you can using the polynomials that you got over the field that you're working with. All right, I, that's all I got to say about that. <coughs> At the moment, any questions? I mean, maybe I'm afraid to ask if there are any questions. <laughs> Would you like to see an example with numbers? Okay. You could you could take a given matrix, right? And you could put it in um you could you could you could put it in either Jordan form or rational canonical form. I mean if if the Jordan form exists, you could you could try to put it in either. And I, I do think uh oh. Uh oh. Hmm. It's not one. Aha. Uh oh. So, the thing I guess I should warn you guys, the the text, the required text. What it has to say about how to compute things with Jordan forms, very, very limited. It doesn't really tell you much. Okay, so if you want to think about the questions about Jordan form, you really need to look at my notes, which is kind of tricky right now since I'm still writing them. So I would encourage you, I would encourage you to look at 2015 chapter 11. That has most of what you need already, and I'm just working on putting it into this year's language. I'm not there yet. I'm working on it, though. That's not it.
<laughs> from my brother thank you Bill yeah it is it is truly amazing it is it is it is it is it is full of awesomeness that is true all right um so I, I sent you guys a link to this before class actually this is a, um, a, P a PDF my brother made with some actual honest to goodness numerical examples of how to find Jordan forms um, and so basically, the first order of business is to find the eigenvalues. And then you just go looking at the rank of like A minus your eigenvalue, and you try to figure out what it is. Um, and you can look at those and figure out from the ranks how many chains you have and how big they are. I will not try to explain. I don't think you really need that much theory to work the problems I've given you guys. But uh, he, he does that in here. And anyway, here's the, uh, <coughs> the Jordan form. Oh, that's not it. That's not Jordan form. Eventually, he gets to this being the, that's not the Jordan formula. He'll get to it eventually. Here's the Jordan form. No, still not it. Fine. So eventually, he shows here that if you do a similarity transformation by that matrix Q, which he explains how to construct, you'll get to this Jordan form for the original ugly matrix A. In this case, there's a chain of generalized eigenvectors of order 2 of eigenvalue minus 1. And then there's an isolated one chain with eigenvalue minus one. So there's, there's that one. Now I wanted to show you this because it's fun. Here's another matrix. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, how big is this thing? I don't know. It's a matrix with, oh, I think it's 11 by 11. An 11 by 11 matrix. It's rational, right? It's a rational matrix, simple. Fractions of whole numbers, not a big deal. Um, yeah, so there's A. And um, by the way, if you guys use Maple, there's built in, as he explains here, um, Jordan form commands. Some of you use Maple Sim, right, in engineering? So you know Maple? Yeah? No. Use MATLAB. Fine, MATLAB also has Jordan form. Good for you. All right, so. <laughs> I mean. MATLAB. Yeah, I mean, you can you could find this from MATLAB, I think. But um, here's the Jordan form of that awful matrix. And see, I mean, that's, and that's the point. It's like we take something that's so entirely complicated, you have never hoped to understand what the thing really is. And when you put it in like this, all you have to do is kind of like look at it. I can tell you how many, what's, how many eigenvectors there are. Like, there's an eigenvector. That's an eigenvector. There's an eigenvector associated to this one, this one, that one. So like the geometric multiplicity is one, two, four. Anything that. How are you finding that eigenvector? Well, anything, if there's a, if I take E1, if I take E1 times this matrix, I get back five times E1. So E1, the standard basis E1, is a eigenvector with eigenvalue five. Any, any column which just has one number in it and that number happens to be on the diagonal, that corresponds to an eigenvector. That, so if there's a one above it, that's more like this. <laughs> See, t times f2 is 2f2 plus f1. That's that one above the diagonal. Like this is a generalized, coming from a general, so like e2 would be a generalized eigenvector. And it's just order two, because there's like a block right here. And look here, this one is a three by three block. That's going to correspond to a three chain. And then here is a just a five sitting on its lonesome. There's a one by one five block. Here's another two by two, um, block, uh, two chain with eigenvalue two. Another isolated five eigenvalue, eigenvector eigenvalue five. And here's another two by two, two block. Yeah, so let's see here. Um, how many twos are there? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That means that the algebraic multiplicity of two, seven. The geometric multiplicity of eigenvalue two, how many eigenvectors are there with eigenvalue two? One, two, 
Three, yes, three. So that means we're four eigenvectors short of an eigenbasis when we think about the eigenvalue two. We have to go looking for generalized eigenvectors to fill out the basis to find the Jordan form. Golly, and there's the, <laughs> there's the goodness gracious. Now, um, so this actually describes somewhat explicitly how to do it, okay? So you can, if you, I don't think I've asked you this though. If you look at the questions I've asked you, they're all pretty like small examples. And so you can, oh man, I was gonna use this still. Um, oh well. They're all, they're all relatively low dimensional examples and they don't have the computational complexity that requires MATLAB or Maple. You can just figure it out using techniques like my 2015 notes at worst. Um, so there's that. Um, this is a handout that um, I know some of you are Bernie, Bernie Sanders supporters, so you appreciate this. But um, I'm just, I'm being facetious. I, I, I don't know if any of you actually support I don't know if any of you feel the burn or not. I, I'd rather vote for Ted Cruz. I'll accept that. Let's see here. <laughs> um, so on the front, this is from my brother Bill, as he calls it, the Eigen handout, appropriately titled. This is from Math 2240 at Appalachian State University. As you can see, all of their courses are easily 10 times better than ours where they have courses numbered in the thousands. See here. On the back side, <clears throat> settle down. On the back side, <clears throat> I have the first page of a wonderful PDF I found published by, I think this is from some, some guy at UCLA, if I remember right. This, I have a link to the full PDF on the announcement I sent you guys earlier today. In fact, I found a bunch of little like three or four page PDF which have explicit four by four, five by five examples and a description of how you actually calculate the Jordan basis for explicit numerical examples. Again, I don't think you actually need to do that for my homework, but it might be helpful for you to understand better what are the blocks and how are they coming and together and so forth. Um, okay. So there, there's that. And, but the first page of this is really nice because it's got all the basic facts about eigenvectors and eigenvalues put together. All right, so let me do my level best to explain to you the notion of complexification. <clears throat> All righty, so um, Here's the problem. So the trouble is, right guys, I think I have by now convinced you that you don't want to think about the rational canonical form. Yes. Have I convinced you of that? Yes. Okay, good. I guess I <laughs> didn't do my job. Um, it's a subset of MATLAB. <laughs> <laughs> math, oh. Oh, it's math. Yeah, well, we do study math in here, that is true. Um, I don't deny it. Um, excuse me. So the rational canonical form is kind of a drag. And it would be nice if we had something else that always worked, right? The trouble with reals, the trouble with the real numbers is that sometimes you don't have eigenvalues that are real, right? There are many matrices which have complex eigenvalues, right? So if you're just working with a real vector space, then the eigenvalues don't exist, so what do you do? Well, there's this wonderful thing. You can take any real vector space, so V over the reals, and you can construct the complexification of V, which I call V sub C, as follows. What you do is you take pairs, x comma y, such that x and y are vectors in V. This can be given the structure of a complex vector space as follows. How do you add vectors in V sub C? Well, x1, y1 
plus x2y2 is equal to, you just add the components. It's just the direct, um, you know, just, just the Cartesian product thing. We did this as an example in my notes way earlier. Right. Of course, if you just take <coughs> if you just take real scalar multiplication, this would just be <coughs> excuse me <coughs> a real vector space of, of dimension two, right? Twice twice the dimension of v. But that's not <coughs> that's not what I'm going to do. I'm now going to describe a scalar multiple. How to multiply a plus i b times the vector x comma y. So here's the definition of scalar multiplication in the complexification. It's just the following. What you do is you do ax minus by comma um, ay plus bx. Or I guess you could say bx plus ay. I don't know, whatever you want, however you want to write it. The order doesn't matter. It's a vector space they commute. All right. Now that, folks, is, where am I, I had a sheet up here somewhere. I didn't give it to you guys, did I? <clears throat> right. And um, so the point here, right, is that you can check that these two things, these do what? These. These give v sub c the structure of a complex vector space. What's that mean? All that means is we have scalar multiplication by complex numbers. Right? But that also means if we study linear transformations on the complexification of v, it makes sense to talk about eigenvalues which are complex, right? And so you can, you can easily prove that this is a legit scalar multiplication. Now here's the notation we use because this comma stuff is really kind of a drag. So <clears throat> instead of saying x comma y, we write without, loss of, without ambiguity, we write x plus i y. And so we also have um, so here, like, x is an element of the vector space v, whereas um, i, y is an element of what we call i, v. So these are the, x is a real vector, and then i, y is a pure imaginary vector. Generally speaking, a vector in the complexification is a sum of a of a pure real vector and a pure imaginary vector. Um, you also have a direct sum decomposition. This is the direct sum decomposition. You have v sub c is equal to the real vectors, direct sum with the pure imaginary vectors. The only thing which is both pure imaginary and pure real is what? Zero, yeah, zero itself. So this is, in fact, a, honest to goodness direct sum decomposition. The intersection of these, you can prove these are subspaces. All right. Um, but they're, they're real subspaces. So this is not a, um, not a direct sum decomposition in the sense of a complex vector space. This is, this is over the reals, technically speaking, okay? But anyway, <clears throat> all right, so let me get to it here. What this actually does for specific examples is very, intu very, very intuitive. If you look at, for example, the complexification of the reals, you just get the complex numbers. If you look at the complexification of m by n matrices over the reals, the complexification of this, what you get is m by n complex matrices. Because all this really does is it changes the scalars in your vector space from real scalars to complex scalars. And that's exactly the connection between these vector spaces, right? Like this is the same as that. It's just that this has real scalars, whereas that has imaginary scalars. 
So, by the way, if V is equal to the real span over beta, span over the reals, all right, of beta, then the complex, you can prove this, the complexification is equal to the complex span of beta. For example, um, if I have like v is equal to, I don't know, the span of say 1x x squared over the reals, then the complexification of this is just the span over the complexes of 1x x squared. They are different vector spaces. Right? If you wanted to compare them, I mean, you could also interpret a complex vector space, right? Every complex vector space is also a real vector space because if you can multiply by a complex number, you can also multiply by a real number, right? So we can always reinterpret the complexification as a, as a double dimension, double, you know, like a twice, a two dimension, two, um, I need a name. <laughs> this is also, you could look at this as a two times the dimension over the reals, right, of V, um, R vector space. If you wanted to, you could think of it that way, right? And the basis for that, we've already talked about before, right? Remember we talked about this? Like, if you want to look at it as a real vector space, what, what basis do we, do we talk about using? We could use, like, what? Something like what? Like 1 I X I X X squared I, I X squared. Remember that? There was a homework problem. Okay. All right. So what? So how how do you you know we're, we're studying endomorphisms, right? So suppose you have a real endomorphism. So here's another definition for you. If we have T that goes from a real vector space V to another real vector space V, all right, linear transformation. then the complexification of this the complexification of this t tilde is a mapping from the complexification of v to the complexification of of v and how do you define it So I have to define t tilde of x plus i y equals something. Now x plus i y is an arbitrary element of the complexification, right? Everything in the complexification can be written as a real vector x plus i times another real vector y. So if you can tell me the formula for this, we uniquely fix the formula for the complexification of t. What is it? What does it have to be? has to be this. It has to be t of x plus i times t of y. That's it. So what am I really saying here? Let's see, let's, let's think about a typical example, right? Differentiation, right? The um, t equals to uh, d dx, right? And then say on, you know, smooth functions over the reals. So what would the complexification be? So that would be, it would act on what? Something like u plus iv, where here 
u and v are smooth real valued functions. Right? And the, if we follow the definition, then this would be what? This would be t of u plus i times t of v, right? Which is exactly what? du dx plus i times dv dx. Now, you may recognize that. That's actually how we define the derivative of a complex valued function of a real variable, right? So it's, it's in sync with this idea of complexification. <coughs> Another example. Suppose I have a equals to 1 minus 1, 1, 1. Right? Then I can say, so this gives me a linear transformation, L sub a, which goes from what? From R2 to R2, right? What would the complexification of a look like? Or what's the complexification of L sub a? L sub a tilde would be what? If that x on x plus i, y, well, it's, yeah, x plus i, y, where x and y, uh, maybe I shouldn't use x and y here. Let's say, um, ah, how about u plus i, v? No, I don't like that either. What do you guys want? U plus i, right, u plus i, v, fine. I can't make up my mind here. Then, allegedly, this is just L sub a times u, right? plus i times l sub a times v, which is what? In other words, it's a u plus i times a v. What is that? That's a times u plus i v. What is this really saying? What is the complexification? It, it says you use the same formula, you just replace the arguments with complex arguments instead of real arguments. What are the eigenvalues of A? Right? So this is what? Lambda minus 1 quantity squared plus 1, right? So if this is equal to 0, that implies what? That implies lambda is equal to 1 plus or minus i. Where does, I mean, technically speaking, those are not eigenvalues for a, right? I mean, it depends on what I mean, OK? These are not eigenvalues for L sub a, right? Because L sub a is a transformation, linear transformation on a real vector space. <coughs> You can't have unreal eigenvalues, technically speaking. But you could say, it would be reasonable to say that it's a complex eigenvalue for A with the understanding what that means, really, is that L sub A tilde has eigenvalues lambda equals to 1 plus or minus i. Now this thing, um, this, this matrix A right here, this thing, that's, I think, already the real, the real Jordan form. So what the real Jordan form is going to be is anytime we have a complex eigenvalue, all right, we're going to look at the complexification of the transformation. And that's going to give us something that's almost diagonal, but in fact, it's actually a rotation times a dilation. And we'll have blocks of these things. And there'll be ones over the super diagonal. And there's a lot more to tell you. It'll take me all of Friday. As usual, I'm behind. <laughs> so, sorry. I guess I'm done. <laughs> <laughs>